All right. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm Ken Bamberger, the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Professor of Law here at UC Berkeley and the co-faculty director of the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. Um, we're returning for a new semester at UC Berkeley, and I'm really grateful to welcome back Haviv Retigor to explore the current state of affairs four months into the Israel-Hamas war. Um, we will continue to explore the questions facing Israel and facing the region in different ways throughout the spring semester. On February 20th, we'll host our annual Lubitsky Lecture on Israel and the Great Powers. And in this conversation, uh, my colleague Ron Hasner, co-director of the Institute, and Stanford professor Abbas Milani will explore the relationship between Israel and Iran. On April 3rd, we'll host our annual Robbins Collection Lecture on Jewish Law, Thought, and Identity with Yuda Kurtzer, president of the Shalom Hartman Institute. And we also have programs planned this semester on the gender-based violence on October 7th and its aftermath, um, as well as the impact of the war on the Palestinian Arab community in Israel and on prospects for a shared society in Israel. All the time, we continue to invest in our students with a cohort of 30 undergraduate fellows engaged in leadership training, including how to have difficult conversations and how to engage across difference and planning relevant programs for their peers. And all of these programs and activities and events of the Institute are dependent on philanthropic support from the community. So we thank you and we're super grateful uh, for your continued support. Today, we're holding our fourth virtual webinar with Chaviv Retigor. Um, Chaviv is a veteran Israeli journalist who serves as senior analyst for the Times of Israel. Um, and uh, we've been very privileged to have him in this ongoing series since September, especially as, particularly after October, he's become one of the most in-demand speakers, allowing folks outside of Israel to try to understand what's going on on the ground. So, Aviv, uh, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Ken, thank you so much for having me. It's good to be here. Thanks. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's been a hard time. Um, the longest war, depends on how you count it, but in the history of Israel, um, a lot of kind of moral questions, how to balance questions of hostages and uh, take actions that will ensure future safety in Israel, um, how much to push back on the Northern Front uh, with the threat of Hezbollah. Um, and I wanna to get to all of those, but first I'll ask, um, how are you doing? And uh, what's what's the feeling on the ground? Um, we're doing okay. Uh, it's hard to, it's been a long time. Uh, we're 120 something days in. And um, one uh, of my brothers-in-law who was in for about 120 days came out last week of, of Gaza. Uh, while he was in there, his first child was born. He saw that child probably 10 days in 100. Um, another one went deeper in uh, to the battle in Khan Yunis. Um, the war in Gaza is transforming slowly. In the north, it's already transformed. In the south, it's slowly turning into a counterinsurgency. Everybody understood that that's what was going to happen. There would be an Israeli takeover of the ground, and then there would be a long counterinsurgency in which Hamas tries to exhaust the Israelis. That's something that Defense Minister Gallant said uh, back in October. It's not, you know, nobody's surprised. But um, but it just means that what we've been going through is going to last a long time. Um, been watching very closely the questions of Palestinian um, humanitarian um, crisis happening in southern Gaza, especially, um, and and with a lot of frustration because there are a lot of um, elements, um, structural elements, institutional elements, um, both Israeli, but not just Israeli. And the Israeli ones are very frustrating and happy to talk about them. But 
um, international aid, um, Egypt, all kinds of limits, not on moving the people around, which is something with a lot of political, a lot of political weight to it, but just with aid, actual aid coming in. And um, so that has been something weighing on us. So there's a, a family element. There's very much skin in the war. There's the um, we see what the world sees um, element. And there's the knowledge also that the war is much larger than Gaza. Mm -hmm. Hezbollah is part of a larger axis in which uh, Hamas is embedded. And it is committed to our destruction. On October 7th, we discovered that they were not deterred and they were not contained. And therefore, why would Hezbollah be deterred or contained? How can we ever again trust our own assessment of whether the enemy is deterred or contained? And therefore, 150,000 missiles that lie in South Lebanon beneath 200 villages, all of them are meant to be used. So my brother-in-law, who came out of Gaza after 120 days and now has a little bit of a two, three week period of a break, and then he's going back to work. But the army told him, you know, don't get too comfortable. You could be back in reserve duty in the summer for, for the North. And so we're living in a moment that feels liminal. It feels in between things, um, a moment it, of decision. Does it seem like a move from um, a sprint to a, to a marathon? I think so. I think we've been in the marathon stage for a couple of months already. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really is exhausting. Um, it's It weighs on everybody. Um, we have uh, friends, a family uh, at Kibbutz Be'eri who had three members killed and eight members taken hostage of the family. My wife's friend, Shaked, her, um, her sister was taken hostage with her two kids. And they work closely together in a small NGO. I mean, so seven of the eight hostages came out in the first hostage exchange, but one is still there. Shaked's brother-in-law is still in Gaza, a hostage. And so we're, you know, she met with the family just last week. And and so we're still in that as well. And it's just, it, it grinds and it's moving on. And in some ways, Israel has returned to a kind of normalcy that is absolutely not normal. Um, hundreds of thousands of people at the war or volunteering or helping the families, hundreds of thousands of people displaced for 120 days. People, survivors of, 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 Octo of October 7 who lived near Gaza, almost the entire city of Sterot, at least 86,000 people from the northern border who fled and won't go back until they know that Hezbollah is not going to attack. Um, so it's a marathon. It's exhausting. We also know that we have no choice. Knowing that you have no choice is extraordinarily helpful in a crisis. And so I think that I feel the determination. I feel an easy determination. I know that we're going to stick it out. I know that my brother-in-law, who's gone into Khan Yunus now, he wants to get rid of Hamas. And, um, that's, and, and he's willing to stay 300 days if it means getting rid of Hamas in Gaza, separate from the vast and critical political questions and day after questions and humanitarian questions, which, again, are vital, we should talk, we have to talk, but that's basic determination to remove that threat uh, is something that that holds Israel together and, and I think gives us a resilience um, that, frankly, our enemies are, are themselves surprised by and are, are not only starting to discover. And it's not just reservists that are being notified that they'll be called back again or extended, um, pulled away from their families and businesses. Uh, it's also change in the in the in the rules of or consideration of change in the rules of of regular troop practice. Yeah. Yes, I am forty three. A um, few years ago, the army let me go. I finished about 20 years of reserve duty. That's why I'm not in the war. The bill currently presented in the Knesset um, would raise my service, uh, different categories of soldiers to different ages, but my service to 45. So if the bill passes in the next month, uh, I'll be doing a month and a half of reserve duty this year and a month and a half of reserve duty next year. I'll be back in the army. It's a strange thing. Three years, you know, you... You age out, you know, you go through that midlife crisis triggered by the army telling you you're old now, go away, right? You buy your guitar, right? <laughs> and 
after that midlife crisis, the army's like, oh, by the way, we're extending it. So it, it it's part of, yes, um, uh, something like 9% or 8% of Israelis do reserve duty in a meaningful way, a serious combat reserve duty. And the army needs a much larger army. If we're going to have a six-front Iranian proxy war that you know, this this immense long war that we are now understanding is underway that we were blind to until October 7th. Um, we weren't blind to the existence of these enemies, but we were blind to the fact that they are willing to, frankly, demolish their own countries in the bid to destroy us. Um, so we need a much larger army. So the army is growing in two ways. It will be drafting more people, each, each cohort of 18-year-olds, uh, a great number, the army simply lets go, doesn't want, or for some reason they disqualified from military service. More of those will be serving and extending the uh, the uh, age at which uh, reservists are released. You know, it puts a, a whole different valence on the domestic concerns and, and debates that we spoke with in the first of this four-part series back in September before the war, um, when we left, we said, we're supposed to meet again. And, and when we meet again in October, uh, we'll talk about the proposal in front of the Knesset to permanently um, exclude Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, from military service completely. Um, of course, when we came back in October, we had lots of other things to talk about. Those domestic issues were... Uh, no longer on the on the front burner, um, but um, how does that all play out? Um, those issues didn't go away, and and um, if, if what you're talking about is true in terms of an entire reshifting of of national service, um, what what's the implication for kind of domestic the domestic unity um, that you also have been talking about with us? Um, the presentation of this bill has brought back the sense, uh, the, the really difficult and painful questions and angry questions being directed at the Haredi community, at the ultra-Orthodox community, um, and brought it back in ways that the ultra-Orthodox community itself has found deeply uncomfortable. The ultra-Orthodox community saw a rise in identification with mainstream Israeli Jewish society, we'll call it. I don't know what you call, you know, uh, from secular to orthodox, but not ultra orthodox. That that Jewish part of Israel of that religious type, um, October seven raised the sense, according to pollsters, according to tremendous amounts of circumstantial evidence, raised among the ultra orthodox the sense of belonging to that larger Israel. Um, and that we even had this first, you know, glimmer of military, of a desire to serve in the military. Some Haredim, um, including um, prominent ones, journalists who are fairly well known, things like that, um, joined the army. Actually, just volunteered for. You can volunteer for reserve duty. And they volunteered, got some, you know, two week of simple basic training, and went to do something uh, in the army that was uh, obviously non combat. Um, and people started to wonder, is there a shift underway? We are now four months in. We've been taking a lot of polls, and we have the numbers. And the answer is no. There's no shift underway. Um, the the spike in, a, in military volunteerism, uh, I think, capped out at about 300 people. It was enough to generate initial surprised headlines. It was not enough to actually be anything more than that. Mm -hmm. um, and the polls tell us that um, when you ask the ultra-Orthodox community, and the ultra-Orthodox community is, is an incredibly diverse place, um, large numbers of Sephardi, Mizrahi, ultra-Orthodox believe that people should serve, and some significant number of them do serve. On the Ashkenazi side of the ultra-Orthodox, that's very different. That's radically different. And in the Litvak side of the Ashkenazi side, 
you don't have to know all these terms to you know to anyone listening in but there are very very different groups with very very different religious traditions and cultures that they all kind of mush together into the ultra orthodox and outsiders don't necessarily distinguish but there's a huge diversity of opinion also about military service so for example quite a few of the members of Knesset of the Shas ultra orthodox Sephardi party served in the army um personally they themselves so um that's that's one point but among the Ashkenazi especially Litvak, Lithuanian, um, ultra, which is about a quarter of them in Israel today. Rates of service are um, incredibly uh, low. And the um, the sense that military service is something that they should do is not rising. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. one sentence, there, with maybe a couple of semicolons, there is a, um, there is a strange shift not in the willingness to join, which they are not willing to do, but in the willingness to appreciate other ultra-Orthodox joining. What do I mean? 20 years ago, I served with some ultra-Orthodox soldiers in a special unit that they joined for a very it's a simple infantry battalion, but they tried to religiously be able to accommodate them. It was an experimental unit to see if the ultra-Orthodox can serve in the army. And I was brought in from the outside as a, as a company medic. And my soldiers who, when they went home on the weekend after a week of service or two weeks of service, they had to change out of their military uniforms on the base and put on, you know, the other uniform, the ultra-Orthodox dress, because if they showed up in military uniform in their neighborhoods, they would be physically attacked. The antipathy to the idea of ultra-Orthodox joining the army was, was intense. And that's the traditional attitude. Today, not a single soldier, ultra-Orthodox soldier, and there are a few thousand in the army, not a single one of them who goes home takes off their uniform. And when they go home in uniform, they're treated with respect. So there's been a profound shift, but not joining, not actually an enlistment shift, but a shift in willingness to respect and even appreciate and even be grateful for those soldiers. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to make of it, but it's a much more subtle shift, maybe a deeper one, maybe long-term, a profound one, it's a subtle shift, but it is real. It is not enlistment. Mm -hmm. um, widening the lens from your vantage point, um, what's the sense of, I, I want to table the hostages for a minute because I, 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 we'll talk about them in a dedicated way, but um, what's, what's the sense of how the war is going after this long period of time, whether it be um, military accomplishment, um, loss of Israeli lives, minimizing loss of uh, Gazan lives. Uh, you mentioned getting aid uh, to, to communities that need it within Gaza. Is there a sense on the ground as to whether things are yeah. going well or not well? Well, those are so. Those are a few different questions they on are. the military side. Um, I think that most Israelis believe things are going okay. It's hard to understand a long war. Israeli, I would say, Israeli war fighting culture. What Israeli sort of assumptions about what war is as as a, 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 just as a cultural artifact. Um, think of war as something fast, decisive and limited so that we fight a war, somebody wins, somebody loses, and then we all go back to the farm to live our lives, right? Go back to the city, go back to the, right? War is contained. This is a very Western view of, of war. Um, in many places in the world, war is long, war is sort of ethnic, long drawn out ethnic conflict, rather than states having a decisive confrontation to decide a political question. And wars tend to be insurgencies, wars tend to be guerrilla, wars tend to have less of that kind of shot. So Israelis are, I think, in, in that, if you take that divide as a real divide, and let's just for the moment just use it for, you know, without testing it too much academically, but um, if you take that divide in culture, there, it's hard for Israelis to feel good about a war that lasts four months just on military grounds. I feel good about a war is a weird way to put it. But what I mean is it's, it's if a war lasts four months, it feels like it's we're losing it. At the same time, that's the kind of war this is. There is no way to do this kind of war. 
a counterinsurgency, an, an insurgency embedded with a guerrilla force embedded within a civilian population that attacks and then hides behind that civilian population at a strategic scale. Uh, I think the, the the fight against ISIS in Iraq and Syria took five years um, and was successful and had tens of thousands of civilian dead. But it was five years of grind and many thousands killed um, on the Iraqi military and Kurdish Peshmerga side, the ground forces. The Americans were the air forces, but the ground forces were Kurds and Iraqis. Um, and it, so, in other words, that's just how these wars go. They last a very long time. They are slow. They are plotting. They are difficult. They are scary on the ground, and they and they exact civilian deaths. And so, the, I, I'll, I'll put it this way: Israeli civilians think the war is going fine. Israeli civilians, the civilian population, will punish a government that stops the war with Hamas still intact in Gaza. And in that sense, there is a grim determination to see it through to the end. Hmm. Soldiers coming out of Gaza, who I have spoken to, and I have spoken to many dozens, soldiers coming out of Gaza to a person tell us that the war is succeeding. There is no battle they engage in where Hamas pushes them back. Um, they have be, they, they've, they've destroyed something like 20% of the tunnel system. That sounds like very little, but a lot of it just recently. In other words, they, the, the fight in, in Gaza City in the north, the beginning of the ground operation back in October, was conducted by an army that had not really had serious ground forces fight battles in in a generation. And the fight in Khan Yunis is by an army that had just fought on the ground a, ground, a massive and complex ground battle in a battlefield the enemy built and chose for three months. And so the Khan Yunis IDF is a much, much more skilled and battle-hardened and tactically sophisticated and experienced IDF than the Gaza City one. That's one major reason that the Palestinian civilian casualty rate has gone way down. A lot of the things that people, that the army planners thought were necessary, airstrikes, some of it is undoubtedly international pressure, specifically pressure from Israel's allies, America, Britain, France. A lot of it is that the army simply doesn't need it. And it didn't know it didn't need it. And now it does know exactly what it needs. And so there's a, a level of, of skill growth that has seen Hamas begin to collapse faster. Tunnels begin to be destroyed, discovered, destroyed. A lot of the traps, a lot of the attempts of, by Hamas to lay ambushes are disrupted. Um, four months in, you shouldn't have 200 dead in the IDF after going into Gaza, after Hamas spent 17 years building the Gazan battlefield just for this. You should have 2,000. You should have at least 800, right? These were numbers that were being thrown around at the beginning. And so the army has turned out to be extremely capable, capable of fighting the war. Again, we're talking military tactics here. Um, and those soldiers coming out say, it's just a matter of time. Give us the time, we'll finish the job. Don't give us the time, you've wasted our sacrifices. Mm -hmm. That's the view. Now, th there is a piece to it. I'm sorry, I'll just... It's an important thing to say. There is a question of hostages, and there's a question of prioritizing the war's goal. If the priority is hostages, maybe you sign a deal, Hamas, fairly generous to Hamas. If the goal is destroying the Hamas regime in Gaza, you can't sign such a deal, even at the cost of hostages. And there is that debate. And that's a debate also about how the war is going. People who favor getting favoring the hostages don't think the war is as winnable as people who favor prioritizing the, the removal of the Hamas regime. A lot of that correlates to trust in the government, it, trust in Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister. So there's also a political identity element here. So you asked a question, what do Israelis think is happening in the war? There are layers to that, to the lenses that Israelis, through which Israelis view what's actually happening on the battlefield. The closer you are to the battlefield, the more optimistic you are that it's possible. And um, and committed you are to getting it done. Say a little more about uh, the debate that's going on around the hostages um, and what those dynamics are, and um, uh, how that's playing out, especially in light of the current discussions um, of of the proposals and Biden's kind of doubling down to try to try to make this happen. 
On, um, I think it was October 25th, the uh, ground maneuver began. And the hostage families, the families of the hostages, back then there were 240 of them, um, they came to Defense Minister Gallant and they said, you are, you just, you're, you just murdered our families. In other words, you are launching a ground invasion of Gaza where our family members are being held. And in this war that is coming to Gaza, they will be killed. If they're not killed by the IDF, you know, entering Gaza, the, by IDF fire, they're going to be killed by Hamas. And Gallant had a conversation with them. It was behind closed doors, but the families immediately, you know, told journalists everything that was said there. In army headquarters in Tel Aviv, um, Gallant sat down with these families and he said to them, what has basically been Israeli policy and the Israeli argument about hostages ever since. And that was, if we allow Hamas to dangle hostages in front of us in exchange for delaying the war, which is what Hamas was doing at the beginning. Before the ground invasion in the two, three weeks after October 7, Hamas said, we'll release two hostages a week as long as the ground invasion doesn't happen. And Gallant said, if that's what we, if we play that game, if we play Hamas's game, they will be immune, they will survive, they will carry out more October 7s and take more hostages. And the hostages themselves will probably end up dead because they'll be sitting in Gaza for five years before we can get the, any meaningful number out. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to invade and we're going to push Hamas to the wall. And when Hamas can't breathe because of massive military pressure, it's going to buy days of respite, days to regroup with significant numbers of hostages. We are going to lower the cost that Hamas can demand for hostages by raising the cost of Hamas of not letting go of those hostages. That's the policy. Gallant's argument was explicit. The, the war to destroy the Hamas government in Gaza and the war goal of getting the hostages out, they have the same policy. They're the same act. They're the same effort. They're the same military pressure on Hamas. I have to say... I don't know what happens with the remaining hostages. I don't know if we're getting them out. I don't know how many are alive. But that policy has already been wildly vindicated beyond anybody's expectations. Nobody imagined the hostage release that we had, um, what was it, November, December? It was in December, right? Um, nobody imagined that Hamas would be releasing for 10 to 14 a day just to have another day in which the IDF isn't advancing. And they used that time. They needed that time desperately. They they maneuvered in Gaza City to make sure that, to survive. So a lot of them got out of Gaza City in that time. And for Israel, that was fine. And there are even people um, in Gallant's orbit who say things like, um, when, you know, some Sinwar himself, the head of Hamas in Gaza, the main planner of October 7, um, he's holding some hostages around him. And he's holding them for the last minute. And at the last minute, when the IDF comes in, he is hoping to offer those hostages in exchange for his safe passage to Egypt. And this person who I was talking to said, and you know what? Fine. Let him. We'll take those last hostages. He'll get a safe passage to Egypt. And then he's the Mossad's problem, not the army's problem. That's the attitude around Gallant. Um, so that's the Israeli policy, and it's been the Israeli policy. I think most Israelis understood that policy. Most Israelis accepted that policy. There haven't been mass protests on the hostages until the last two weeks. In the last two weeks, uh, the families of the hostages started a protest, uh, some, I think two weeks ago, um, late January, in Tel Aviv. And to everyone's astonishment, a hundred thousand people turned out to the protest mm -hmm. to say the government has to now i mm -hmm. asked some of these protesters don't you understand that if you raise the pressure on the government to get the hostages out hamas speaks hebrew hamas is following our daily news hamas knows that the public pressure on the government to really to to pay a high price for the hostages is rising and so Hamas's price is rising. 
Don't you understand that by raising the pressure on the government to get the hostages, the government's not holding these hostages, Hamas is holding these hostages. By raising the pressure on the government, you're actually hurting the government's bargaining position and making it harder to get the hostages out? And the answer in more than one case was fascinating and, and rational. The answer was trust. It was about trust in the Israeli political leadership which this is a political leadership with a massive trust deficit among Israelis because of the judicial reform fight, because they are the leadership on October 7th that brought us the policies that led to October 7th. And so one person, uh, the way they described it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the way they described it was, um, they were talking about specifically Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, but I think they meant it about more politicians than just him. Um, the way they described it was, if they have to choose between their political survival and getting our family out of Gaza, they're gonna choose their political survival and let our family members die. And they're gonna, their political survival is only gonna be assured by holding on to the far right parties of Netanyahu's coalition who are demanding a no serious meaningful uh, price be paid for the hostages and a complete you know, war to the end with Hamas. And so it's not for Netanyahu, because his policy of, of being tough on the hostage negotiations isn't because he believes in the policy, it's because he's trying to survive and not shedding and, and, and trying not to lose his far right coalition partners. And so if we create a pressure on the other side and say, actually, you're going to have a massive public uprising because we think you don't care about the hostages, then his policy will shift back to his own. We're, we're going to create the countervailing pressure from the far. That's the talk. It's all about distrusting the leadership to care. If there was a sense, there is quite a bit of public trust. We have polls on this of Defense Minister Gallant, but there's extremely low public trust for Prime Minister Netanyahu. If there was a sense that Gallant's policy was what was being pursued now, and there was a serious and good reason to think that massive military pressure on Hamas will get hostages out, if that was the sense that that was the government's policy, those protests wouldn't be happening. The sense is that that this leadership is already is is primarily playing politics instead of running the war, and therefore it's reasonable to protest, even if that has a knock-on effect of raising Hamas's price. So hostages are also complicated, um, but Israelis have a sense. I think the general sense is the war can be won. It's going to be long, drawn out, and grueling. The anger you know the, the army now says we just need a lot more soldiers going forward and that bill is moving forward and there's anger at the ultra orthodox for not doing their part but there is no unwillingness to do the service to continue to serve longer to serve for more years that has not been part of the discourse so there is an understanding that this is necessary a a an understanding that the country has to be mobilized and and an understanding that we can defeat hamas um, the only, I think, Achilles heel, and it's a significant one in this war effort, is the public trust, the lack of public trust in the leadership. Benny Gantz, the head of the National Unity Party, the third member of the war cabinet, um, and Gadi Eisenkot, who's kind of a fourth ex officio member, part also part of the formerly opposition National Union Party, um, are doing extraordinarily well in polling. Does that reflect this trust issue? Is there genuine trust um, in, in them? And, and how does that play out? Yeah, um, I, I, I saw a poll that it's already, I think, six weeks old now, but it's the, it's the poll that asked the question most directly. And I don't think anything profound has changed. Or if it's changed, it's, it's become even more extreme. Um, there was a poll that asked specifically on public trust um, by a reliable polling firm for a pretty well-known political podcast in Israel. And this poll took the five top leaders of Israel, the president, who doesn't matter because it's a not a not an executive position, um, the opposition leader, Yair Lapid, who doesn't matter because he's not actually running the government or the war, and the three people running the war, Prime Minister Netanyahu, Minister Gantz, as you said, and Defense Minister Gallant. And the question was, do you think that this leader is primarily focused on um, the war effort or primarily focused on their own politicking? That was the question. Gallant is the most trusted, 90-10. 90% is focused on the war effort. 10% said he's politicking. Next in line was Gantz, 
excuse me, roughly 80-20, 80% focused on the war effort, 20% politicking. The next was Lapide, 60-40, which I, in his defense, not that I need to defend him, but in his defense, he's the opposition leader. He's not actually running the war. 60% say he's focused on the war, 40% say he's politicking. And then came Netanyahu. Netanyahu was 65-35 the other way. 65% said he's politicking primarily. 35% said he's focused primarily on the war. Netanyahu is the only person in the chain of command on October 7th who has yet to take responsibility for October 7th. Literally the only one. Gallant got up very early on and said, my bad, this was my response. I did, this was my fault. I was the defense minister. This happened on my watch. The head of the army, the head of the Shabak, the head of the Mossad, the deputies of various organizations, deputy head of the army, the head of Southern command, battalion commanders, division commanders, brigade commanders. I saw uh, one 26 year old captain got up on national television and was interviewed. And at one point he said, and it was my fault. Only Netanyahu has not publicly, even when challenged by journalists, has refused to say, he doesn't want that seven second soundbite of him saying it was my fault on the campaign video of, 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 the, of his opponents in the next election. And so Netanyahu from day one has, has been politicking and Israelis see that and feel that. And that explains his catastrophic polling numbers. And is, it is not crazy for many Israelis to think, including huge numbers of, of Netanyahu voters, maybe former Netanyahu voters, I don't know, that um, to be thinking that that the politics guides also some of his some of his conduct in the war, some of how he thinks about the war. Um, uh, one last kind of broad question on on questions of domestic policy, and then maybe we can look uh, look at foreign policy questions. But um, we've talked about some division about who serves, going back to the divisions that pre-existed the war. Um, we've talked about distrust in Netanyahu, and um, that also resonates on themes from before the war. Um, we see uh, Ben Gvir engaging in directed uh, criticism of Joe Biden um, and uh, his group organizing a conference uh, in, the, in, the, in the Jerusalem Convention Center um, talking about um, uh, resettling Gaza, kind of the most inflammatory issue, um, especially the week after the International Court of Justice uh, was thinking about some of the quotes that were made before, um, forcing Netanyahu himself to come up and say, no, this is not government policy. Um, is Israel going back to days of division? And um, how do you deal with uh, a group within the coalition that is not disciplined around coalition policy? And, and how do you run a war um, with, with all of that going on? Um, again, those are a lot of questions all at once. They are. Um, they are. The, the, the division is back. Um, but the divide is back, and, and it's back for good reason. If you trust Netanyahu, you have one sense of the war. If you distrust Netanyahu, you have another sense of the war, and that's totally rational. It's not back because we are sort of um, irrationally angry at each other in, in some sense. It's back because these this is a question with direct bearing on, on your understanding of how the war is going. Um, and where the war should go and what the government's going to, you know, planning to do after the war, et cetera. Um, but I would say this, it's still not about the politics. In other words, the division is back. 100,000 people came to protest with the hostage families because they distrust Netanyahu. But they could only have that protest against Netanyahu be about the hostage families. The war is still the vocabulary. The war is still the only thing legitimate to talk about in in talk is the only way that it is legitimate to talk about the political divide so for example that same evening where we had that 100,000 protests for hostages there was an old classic anti netanyahu protest on you know that we the kind we saw in the judicial reform and it was 
I don't think 200 or maybe 500 people. It was nothing. It was this tiny little thing. People did not go to it, did not want to go to it. Cam news cameras didn't show up because th there were six other bigger things happening in, within a square mile. And so that sort of old politicking can't happen anymore. It might come back as well. It might come back in three months. But at the moment, um, the divides are back. We feel them. But they're still substantively about the war. Uh, and that's true on the other side as well. Um, uh, there's still um, the Netanyahu campaign, which he launched probably a month and a half ago, almost formally. I mean, Likud Twitter accounts are active again. I mean, in that sense, really formally. Um, the Netanyahu campaign is a campaign that argues that it's, it's the Palestinian state campaign, essentially, in a bid to hold the far right to his banner. Um, after October 7, they have begun to talk about him as no different from Gantz. What's the policy difference between Netanyahu and Gantz? Both are weak, both bring terrorism. And to hold their, them, them to his coalition, he has taken these very public, unnecessary in my view, but you know, maybe he's much cleverer than I am. He probably is. Um, they, they've begun to, he's, he's begun to publicly campaign against the Palestinian state and to warn the Israeli right that if the day after he's not prime minister, but Gantz is prime minister, the Americans will push through a Palestinian state and Gantz won't, won't stop them. And he's the only one who will stop them. Now, that's a really interesting position for Netanyahu to take and to be arguing because Netanyahu supports the Trump plan, right? Emphatically, and that's a state. It's a weird state, but it's a state. And Netanyahu has decades of supporting some kind of Palestinian state with conditions like demilitarization and important conditions, big conditions. By the way, conditions not very different from the center left. And so Netanyahu now saying there's not going to be a state, what does he even mean? He wants Gaza to be run how? By who? That's not a state? What is it? He wants Israel to come back and rule it? He doesn't. He said he doesn't. So what does it? In other words, it's not a policy point. There's no, nobody knows what it means that you don't want a Palestinian state. By the way, the people saying there must be a Palestinian state, we don't know what they mean either. There isn't a Palestinian political or st structure or entity or person who could build that Palestinian state, even if Israel were to evaporate tomorrow morning. There, there are deep problems on the ground and deep concerns and deep questions about that political horizon, how we get there, what are the obstacles, what are the Israeli obstacles, the Palestinian obstacles, the regional obstacles, None of that has anything to do with Netanyahu getting up and declaring he's against a Palestinian state. It's domestic politics. It's holding that right to his banner. So everyone is campaigning, but but they're campaigning on the issues of the war because you can't be seen openly to campaign about politics themselves. Nevertheless, a lot of that driving force actually is uh, is politics. It's it's you know Henry Kissinger uh, famously said back in the '70s, Israel has no foreign policy, only domestic politics, um, which you know masquerade as foreign policy. A lot of that's happening right now too. So, in lumping together our questions, I've frequently given you multi prongs. We also have the other circumstance where we have five or six questions that specifically kind of go to one very simple question: um, Is there a chance of no confidence, new vote, elections, any kind of change in government, or is that uh, or is that a red herring? Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Yep. Um, technically, um, in terms of parliamentary procedure, it's extremely difficult to pull Netanyahu out. The Israeli law requires what we call a constructive no confidence vote, which means that it's not enough for the Knesset to vote no confidence in the government. That does not topple the government. The Knesset actually has to vote in a new government, a new prime minister with a new cabinet. And in this Knesset, with these numbers, barring an election for the Knesset to change the Knesset's numbers, um, it's almost impossible to see who that replacement prime minister would be. And so it's it's extremely difficult to imagine a constructive no confidence vote that topples Netanyahu in this Knesset. How would you get a different Knesset? How would you essentially go to elections, a parliamentary elections? And uh, the answer there is that Netanyahu's um, coalition collapses automatically. The Knesset dissolves automatically if Netanyahu's coalition fails to pass the budget law in spring 2025. 
Spring 2025, if the Knesset can't get it, to, if the coalition can't get it together to pass a budget, it falls. This coalition might survive until then for the very simple reason that in parliamentary systems, this is something that Americans don't always understand immediately, but I guess uh, Latvians do and Austrians do. Um, in, um, in parliamentary systems like ours, um, low polling numbers stabilize a government because none of the members of the coalition want to face the voters when their polling numbers are low. And so the government is stable. Nobody abandons it. Nobody jumps ship. And everybody continues sailing, surprisingly stable, as the government becomes more hated. That's happening to us as well. Ben Gvir and Smotrich, if they leave, Gantz is probably the next prime minister. And so would they leave and be blamed for that by Netanyahu's campaign? Um, Netanyahu has no hope of, of, of getting voted back in. He won the last election in November 2022 by the skin of his teeth. He actually didn't win the popular vote, um, but because a couple of parties on the left ran very stupidly um, with a very poor understanding of math. Um, I'm sorry, going into the election, I wrote and every one of my colleagues wrote, you're going to lose this because you're doing this bad way of structuring your party. And then they lost it because they did the bad way of structuring the parties on the left. So it's just easy for me to say that now. But so Netanyahu really won by... Uh, by a quirk of the system rather than by actual majority vote. And he couldn't afford to lose a single seat. When judicial reform was announced in January 2023, over the next two months, the country is suddenly set on fire. And a good five to seven seats from Likud's centrist wing probably shifted, in the polls certainly shifted, but probably really shifted out of Likud to the center, maybe the center left. And Netanyahu hasn't won an election poll since. He has not won. A, I have not seen a single election poll, and I've seen probably 300 election polls since January uh, 2023. Um, I have not seen one in which Likud wins that election. This coalition is reelected. And so Netanyahu entered October 7 already a man who couldn't win an election if it was held that day and came out of it having shed more votes out of Likud to the far right, with a far right kind of thinking that maybe it's a good time to go to elections. Yes, Gantz will be prime minister for a term, maybe a second term even, but the far right parties will grow. Likud has been, by October 7, has been you know massively hurt. Likud, turns out, can't run the place. We Smotrich Benvir will grow and become a much larger part of the Israeli right, and the future coalition we come back into we will be much more significant players. That kind of talk was already happening in Otsma Yudit and in religious Zionism in the two parties on the right of Likud when Netanyahu launched his Palestinian state campaign. In other words, his campaign is to say to them, if you do that, that thing of sitting in the opposition for a couple of years but coming back stronger, which is what the polls suggest you, you should do, in the interim, we will have an ideological catastrophe namely the Palestinian state. Everybody is suddenly going to all get together and build a Palestinian state in two years. And oh my God, no. That's that's the campaign that Netanyahu is now riding on. Um, Smotrich and Bengvir don't think that's true. But in, their problem is that enough Netanyahu, enough right-wing voters might think it's true for them to be wary of, of breaking apart the coalition. Long story short, Netanyahu might be with us for a while. What would topple him at this point? Um, what would topple him at this point uh, will be if there's a sense that we're in the day after. It's not going to be a specific day. It's not going to be a specific moment. But as long as hundreds of thousands of our brothers and fathers and sons are at the front, as long as half of our society is at a standstill because of the war, there's a sense of an emergency. It's not a time to fight it out. When that sense ends, either because there's a massive drawdown of reservists, something in the war changes, it becomes an insurgency throughout Gaza, there's some kind of an end to massive combat operations in Gaza, and some kind of rebuilding or, or a low simmer counterinsurgency begins. When that happens, then the protests of the victims begins. The victims, the hundreds of thousands of displaced these are circles that include a double-digit percentage of Israeli society. This is not the families of hostages. This is the families, not of 240 hostages that are now, you know, much fewer, 150, I think it is, or 130, something like that. 
this is the families of the 1200 victims who died of the thousands and thousands who were wounded of the tens and of thousands who were displaced just from sterot of the 100,000 displaced in the north and everyone that we're talking about protests of half a million people at a government at a prime minister who has yet to take responsibility for his own policy ending the way it ended that kind of protest on that day after might be something that topples the government and, and just literally brings the country to a standstill because of the sheer scale of what it could reach. I don't know if it's going to happen. A lot of people feel those feelings. And so that's something that you should, you know, watch for signs of that potentially developing when the war itself simmers down. Thanks, Khabib. Let's um, look a little at foreign policy. When the war with Hamas began, um, there were a bunch of voices who said, oh, no, um, this is this will mark the end of the Abraham Accords, of all of the progress Israel is making in terms of normalizing ties um, with, with other Middle Eastern countries. Um, in the last couple of weeks, the foreign minister of, of Saudi Arabia um, was very vocal in saying, Okay, that move is not over. We're not taking it off the table. Um, obviously, uh, we need to come up with a solution for uh, Palestinian society, but we are still interested in partnership. Um, how does that play out? Um, obviously, in the context of this six-front war against Iran. I'll put it very simply. Uh, I, um, the Abraham Accords was never about diplomatic process. Um, the Middle East is not, you know, the uh, foreign policy elites of the West. They don't think in process. Uh, the Abraham Accords was many things, many layered thing um, for the Saudis who have yet to normalize relations with Israel, but without their okay, the Emiratis would not have done so. Um, the Saudis are at the heart of this. For the Saudis, Israel has two huge advantages. Advantage one, it ha is a powerful actor in the region that doesn't have the great disadvantage America has, which is America leaves all the time. America is pivoting to China. America can walk away. Israel can't. And so Israel is an ally that can never ally with Iran, Saudi Arabia's nemesis, and because of Iran in itself, because of the Iranian policy, and also has these immense capabilities and also is stuck in the region with us, with us, the Saudis. And so it's just a useful ally against Iran. The second reason that the Saudis want a peace with Israel, which is a peace that will survive Gaza because it's those, those interests will still be immense, uh, is that Saudi Arabia is in a desperate rush to wean itself off oil and build a new kind of economy that's much more sustainable the day after oil. Vision 2030 of MBS, etc. Israel is the one country in the region that seems to have all the answers on how you build a massive, developed, sophisticated, and 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 uh, and and tremendously prosperous economy without oil. Um, and so Israel is a, a huge potential ally for the Saudis. That's how the Saudis think of Israel um, the day after Gaza, and also as part of their own efforts to reshape Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia's future. There's also a third reason they want to be close to Israel. And that's also the, and that reason has guided all, almost all chatter, almost all diplomatic chatter, and all the things they have actually said publicly about Gaza. And that is that um, Saudi Arabia belongs to an axis in this region of conservative Sunni um, monarchies and forces and ideas and cultures. The Egyptian army, the Jordanian government, the Moroccan government, uh, the Emiratis, the Saudis, the Bahrainis. Um, that are absolutely terrified, that see as their mortal enemy the radical Muslim Brotherhood axis among the Sunnis of the region. So the Qataris, the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt, Hamas, uh, Turkey. Th these are two axes that if you understand them as two alliances pitted against each other, a great deal of what happened in the Syrian civil war suddenly makes sense. A great deal of what's happening in the region broadly suddenly makes a lot of sense. The Saudis want Hamas to lose, and they need Israel to defeat Hamas. And they need, Hamas is a part of the Sunni radical axis, but also embedded 
in the Shia radical axis led by Iran that includes Hezbollah and the Houthis and the militias in Iraq and Syria. By removing Hamas from the chessboard, if Israel does that, if Israel succeeds, two axes that Saudi Arabia views as mortal threats are pushed back. And Israel's long war against Iran, um, which will, which probably will include a war in Lebanon at some point. I mean, nobody quite knows how to prevent that. That long war, if it succeeds, pushes back a mortal enemy even, even farther. And so the Saudis are hungry for Israel to defeat Hamas. And that has led to um, leaks uh, to journalists, to Israeli journalists, um, or, or to you know people I know, I mean, journalists I, I know, uh, from Saudi officials and Emirati officials, um, of messages to the Israelis along the lines of, you know, we want to rebuild Gaza the day after. If you translate that from Middle Eastern speak to normal person speak, finish the job, we'll clean up. It isn't just that the Saudis will somehow manage to make peace with us after the devastation in Gaza. The destruction of Hamas is a major reason to make peace with us after the war. From the Saudi perspective, the fact that this war broke out on the eve of normalization is wonderful. The fact that October 7 happened right before normalization is incredibly helpful to them. Because if we turn out to be incapable of destroying Hamas, of pushing back the proxies that Iran is steadily, Hamas isn't built by Iran, but the part of Hamas that crossed the border on October 7 with satellite imagery, not from Google Maps, but actual satellites, um, that part, that Nukba force with the strategy, that is an Iranian thing. And that piece of Hamas is an Iranian trained, Iranian funded. Um, it was a strategy, by the way, that Hezbollah had been preparing in the North for a decade and talking about openly and publishing YouTube videos showing training for that kind of crossing the border, taking Jewish towns, murdering people, taking hostages at a mass level. Um, and some people in Hezbollah are angry at Hamas for ruining the surprise. Um, but if Israel is incapable of defeating Hamas, then, then, then Saudi Arabia dodged a bullet. It's not going to pay the political costs of making that peace. If Israel can defeat Hamas, irrespective of civilian casualties, that is a secondary question for the Saudis, by the way, and for Hamas and for the Iranians. Irrespective of that question, if Israel can defeat Hamas and push back the Iranian axis and at the same time the Muslim Brotherhood axis, then Israel becomes exactly the kind of valuable ally that the Saudis were hoping it is. And so it's the opposite. The question is a great one, but the assumptions in that question are a misunderstanding of the region. And I think, uh, unfortunately, we've been hearing that, that misunderstanding from the State Department and from many Western analysts. Um, this is a region divided into these axes, and the main question that, that allies, potential allies have of each other is, are you an effective ally in pushing back the axis that threatens me? Not, you know, can I make friends with you if you're mean or if you're terrible or if people hate you? It's the Middle East. That is not going to be what prevents people from making an alliance with Israel. And not only that, um, the, the, uh, the Saudi ambassador to Britain was asked on the BBC just, I think, three weeks ago, live interview, television, BBC, in front of the whole world, given the images coming out of Gaza, given the civilian suffering in Gaza, given the Arab world response to that civilian suffering, is the normalization still on the table? And his answer was a single word, absolutely. In other words, the Saudis are not hoping this ends now with Hamas intact. They're hoping it ends with Hamas destroyed. And they're willing to stomach more civilian casualties for that end because to them, this is strategic. This is existential, not quite at Israel's level, but certainly at some level. Beyond those alliances, um, is there, given, I guess, the tenacity of the axes that you've just described, is there any way for Israel to get out of the sights of Iran and its proxies um, besides ultimately war. Uh, we, we'll talk to Professor Abbas Milani in, uh, in, in a week yeah. and a half. We'll hear his sense of what, what Iran is thinking. 
but from the Israeli side. Yeah, I would like to hear his sense too. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I would say that the Israeli perception. Um, I think. It, I think. I. I think all my, the news I have to report is is bad news. On October seven, we discovered that all of our theories of the enemy's mind. Our analysis of whether the enemy was deterred, whether the enemy was contained, all of those analyses were complete poppycock, just utterly irrelevant. We missed the entire story. Hamas had spent 17 years, 12 years actually at work on it, but 17 years strategizing of ruling Gaza it built nothing in Gaza except those tunnels. And the sole purpose of those tunnels, Gaza is a quarter of the municipal boundaries of London, something like that. And those tunnels are about 150% the London tube. That's the scale of this project. Hamas did nothing in Gaza but tax and steal aid to build those tunnels. And the reason it built those tunnels was to use our own firepower against us. This is a classic anti-colonial insurgency strategy. And it was what the FLN did in, in, in Algeria, and it was uh, what the Viet Cong did in, in, in Vietnam. But nobody ever did it on this scale because there's never been a guerrilla group that was also a government, that hybrid of guerrilla group and government for a significant time over a stable polity allowed Hamas to do this at a scale never before seen in the history of warfare. What did they do? Guerrilla strategy is basically you come out of the civilian population, hit the standing army that is much more powerful than you, and that's why you adopt a guerrilla strategy. You hit that standing army and then melt away into the civilian population and force the standing army, first of all, to find you, which is very difficult. And also, as that standing army hurts the civilian population in the hunt for you, they they create blowback that actually hurts them. So you're trying to get them to hurt your civilians. That's the strategy. Again, of Viet Cong, of FLA, this is this is extremely well known and common in in, in counterinsurgency warfare. It's it may be the great problem of counterinsurgency warfare. Hamas built Gaza to an unprecedented extent for that war, and then launched that war. In other words, we thought for many, many years, and I think I mentioned this also in the last conversation that we had, for, for decades, we thought Hamas was deterred by our massive firepower. And on October 7, we discovered that it was we who had been deterred by our own massive firepower. Because we could not imagine, because Hamas had built those tunnels, we could not imagine something that they would do to us or some threat that they would ever pose to us that would be worth chasing them into those tunnels, that would be worth... What, what that would necessitate, cutting through the civilian population in that way to get to them. That's the war that they made that the only war possible. And we could not imagine them ever posing a threat to us worth taking on the costs of that war, the cost to civilians in Gaza, but the cost to us as well, including of the civilian deaths in Gaza. And then Hamas carried out that attack. The basic result is a profound humility among Israeli policy planners. We do not understand our enemy. While we thought they were deterred and contained, everything that was happening was their strategy. They were building out that battlefield. They were, they were preparing that war in order to launch that war, in order to get those Gazans killed, in order to put a chink in our armor that eventually destroys us. Everything that we thought that we understood about them turned out to be wrong. Literally the whole story. And then we look north at Hezbollah. We look north at Hezbollah with that humility. And that's a very dangerous way to be. Because that means that every one of those 150,000 rockets in southern Lebanon is there to be used. We no longer think they're deterred. And so we're massively building out our army. There was an incident about three weeks ago where 21 Israeli soldiers were killed when two buildings that they had laid explosives in blew, blew up and actually collapsed on them. Um, the, the buildings blew up because the Hamas cell launched an anti-tank missile. Um, I doubt the Hamas cell thought that the buildings were uh, 
were going to blow up in that way. That was astonishing success that I think surprised the Hamas fighters themselves. The vast majority of these anti-tank cells that come out of tunnels and attack are killed instantly. Why were there 21 soldiers inside two buildings laying explosives? The, the actual reason for removing the buildings was so a tank column could come in as part of the army's maneuver to surround the center of Khan Yunus, where some of the Hamas leadership is currently living and where the army is trying to put massive military pressure on and, and close that circle. But why were they doing it as soldiers on the ground? Why didn't they just bomb those two buildings from the air and level them? And the simple answer is the army calls it the missile economy. The army is holding on to missiles. It's holding on to missiles, A, because uh, missiles are not as effective in the tunnel warfare as we thought. In Gaza City, the air campaign did less than the army expected. Again, that air campaign has vast humanitarian civilian costs. Tactically, just for a second, let's single out the tactical question. Tactically, it was less effective than everyone expected in two decades of army planning. And so that's one reason. Without those that air cover, without that massive air cover, there is air cover, but without that massive kind of air cover, the army is doing better in Khan Yunus than it did in Gaza City in terms of hunting down Hamas and getting those tunnels. Um, but also, um, the American uh, capacity to produce missiles and our capacity to produce missiles turns out to just be a bottleneck. We can't build them fast enough to maintain that kind of scale. And the army needs those missiles because the army is preparing for a war in the north. Okay, all of that's all happening at once. The main bottom line is the army is, soldiers are dying on the ground, taking risks on the ground to allow the air force to use fewer missiles so that there is a large arsenal of missiles for a war in the north. That is an indicator of how much the army believes that that war in the north is likely. It's extremely likely. And the army is already arming for it, even as Gaza is still going strong in terms of the actual military campaign. Um, wow. Uh, I have, we have about seven minutes left. Um, I have two questions from two different colleagues that are both kind of good finishers. So let me start with one, and uh, hopefully we can leave a few moments for the other. Um, the first is one about um, kind of reception here in the United States. Um, and um, is there concern about the political cost uh, of uh, kind of long-term war in Israel in terms of public opinion and generational public opinion uh, on, on the US side, US and Europe and elsewhere? There is some concern. Um, I think there should be more. This sort of instinctive Israeli cultural attitude is that we don't depend on the world. Sometimes that's a little bit silly. It allows Israelis to, uh, Israelis are congenitally incapable of telling their story, of explaining themselves to the world. And it's because they, explaining feels like justifying and Israeli culture deeply embedded in our DNA as a culture. By the way, from the earliest Zionist thinkers, um, but it's 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 openly talked about in Israel. We don't justify ourselves. That's what we are. We're the Jews who were not saved by anybody. By the time the Americans became our allies, we'd already won all our big wars that made us a regional power. That's why the Americans made friends with us. And before that, the French found us useful. And before that, in '48, the Soviets were our main arms supplier. They found us useful. We stand on our own two feet. We don't um, ask permission from the world to exist. We don't understand the moral popularity test that's happening out there in the world. Not that we don't understand the, the debate. We understand the debate. We don't understand why Palestinians think it's going to deliver for them. Um, they're going to fight this popularity contest in the world. Um, Habib, I think we've lost your uh, your audio. Oh, and now we've lost you. Oh, you're back. <laughs> 
I hello. I'm not sure what happened, but you can hear me. Yes. Okay. We lost your word. Um, uh, Israelis don't understand how. I was just saying something controversial. Maybe that was a little rescue lever. I don't know. Um, You've been but, told. <laughs> but um, the Palestinian civil society that is at at the heart of the Palestinian campaign on campuses in the West, in the Muslim world as well. It's a different campaign, but it's it also exists. Um, that They're trying to sell the world on a campaign that sees Israel inherently, its existence, its founding, the very idea of Jewish nationhood even, as something illegitimate. It's not about um, specific, um, you know, pull out of the West Bank. That it's not it's not a, a policy that you, that the Israelis can can see. it's it's an, it's something inherent in Israel, and what the Israelis don't understand is why they you know the, to the Israelis the international community is not a place that swings into action to save you to rescue you. These these terms that the world likes to use international community international law. To most Israelis, international law is not something that protects people. It doesn't protect the Uyghurs. It doesn't protect the Bosnians. It doesn't protect the Rwandans. It doesn't actually protect small peoples who need safety. International law is a discourse of the very powerful and very safe that moralizes their power, that, that allows them to depict their power in moral terms, rather than an actual law. Law that isn't enforceable. Is, is that law? I'm very conscious that I'm not a lawyer sitting here in the Berkeley with probably quite a few lawyers in the audience, but that's a profound problem. And the first chapter of every textbook on international law usually starts with the question, is this law, right? And to the Israelis, just instinctively, this this, this is, by the way, a lot of the Israeli attitude to the ICJ question. Um, that's international law that won't protect me. International law that won't tell me what the heck I do, how I destroy Hamas doesn't get to tell me that I'm destroying it wrong. A world that doesn't tell me how I destroy Hamas doesn't get to tell me I'm doing it wrong. A world that doesn't tell me, how, that doesn't swing into action for Hezbollah. Hezbollah has, has violated UN Security Council Resolution 1701 from day one. Nobody ever pretended otherwise. Nobody even imagines that they need to actually carry out this Security Council Resolution. But the world's going to sanction me. That war that is coming in Lebanon will be devastating for Lebanon. Everybody knows it. Everybody sees it. Everybody watches it coming. Where's international law, institutions, community, all these words that don't actually exist. Westerners feeling feelings about Palestinians isn't going to rescue Palestinians. One of the Israeli arguments, not arguments even, I was a soldier on the northern border looking at the villages across the border, knowing there are thousands of rockets under them meant to murder me, knowing the organization that lives there wants me to die, knowing there are civilians in that village and wondering where the heck the world is, what the world community that we hear so much about on the news actually is going to do about it. And so when for Israelis, by the way, the fact that the world doesn't swing into action for Palestinians all of this emotion, but no action, is part of that part of that argument. If you would protect me, I would respect you protecting them. But you're not even protecting them. Never mind me. And and you know when when the Muslim world, it's even worse. When the Muslim world is desperately concerned about Gaza, but not about Yemen or Syria, it's probably not concerned about civilian deaths. It's probably concerned about something. It's hard for Israelis to take seriously. Um, this kind of discourse in the world. And it's hard, therefore, for Israelis to understand. By the way, they need to take it more seriously. And I'm not even saying that people who feel horror at what's happening to Gazan civilians are not honest. They're absolutely honest. The place where this becomes dishonest is much more subtle and much more downstream from those honest moral emotions. But it does become dishonest. It does become structurally useless. It does become an international community that mostly sits around talking about itself rather than helping in any way the people who need help. And so Israelis are looking at this Palestinian. Um, I realize I may have left the question far behind. What was the question? I apologize. No, I, I, you've done good. But I have, a, I have a, one last question that you have one minute for. Wait. Okay, one minute, and but hopefully we'll answer the last question. And then I'll work, or you will good. The last question, one minute. Um, do you have any sense from military decision makers about what symbolic success 
would signal a turning point in the war? Uh, like, like, how will the Israeli public know that it's time to, to breathe a sigh of relief? We're past that. Mm -hmm. There are no more symbolic successes. There are no more images of victory. That's not what this is about. Any more than America was looking for images of victory in the Pacific in World War II. This is existential. They plan to destroy us. Hamas looks small to the world. It looks bigger to us. It murdered our kids. But Hamas is embedded in a array of proxies that we learned on October 7 actually are out to kill us and are willing to demolish their own countries to do so. And so it is existential. And it's going to be existential for quite a while. And so we don't care. Hamas is going to have a clever photo. Some Israeli soldier is going to do something terrible, and that photo is going to go viral. Some flag is going to be flown somewhere. Some Hamas guy is going to sneak across the border again in two months. There's going to be all these little whiz-bang PR stunts. And none of them matter. The thing that matters is removing the absolute deadly threat to our kids. The thing that matters is removing the perpetrators of October 7th. And the thing that matters is the 86,000 people who can't go home to the north. The very fact that the Israeli government is putting them all up in hotels tells you the Israeli government plans to solve that problem as well. By the way, let's talk about the wisdom of the crowds. 100,000 Lebanese villagers have also left that border area, left those villages, and fled northward in Lebanon and have not returned home in three months as well. So the residents of the northern end of that side of that border and the southern end of the side of the border think that that war is coming. The war is going to expand, not shrink. It might take a year. It might take two. There's some talk in Israel that expanding ind indigenous uh, missile production capacity is a two-year timeline. It'll be about two years before Israel is actually independent of uh, the need to ask the American president for missiles in order to fight its wars. It's the order has gone out that that production capacity is already being expanded, but that might be the timeline. In other words, we may have now a period where Gaza kind of simmers down and then we're in a kind of in between period and it might be two years. And then the Lebanon war comes because we have to get rid of that threat because the threat is real now. So there are no images of victory anymore. There's an enemy and the enemy is coming for us and we're going to meet it. Aviv, sobering words. Um, thank you so much again for joining us, for joining us repeatedly this year. Uh, we're hoping very much that we can bring you here to Berkeley in person and look forward to that. Um, and thank you thank all you. for joining. Um, it's been a pleasure. Take care.